All right, Alexander, let's uh, talk about the Vilnius NATO summit. And uh, the summit is now over. Everyone is going to their respective homes. <laughs> maybe not Aletsky. Maybe he's going to continue to travel around Europe because I don't think he, he really wants to go home. But um, what, are, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, I think everyone agrees, even the collective West media, that mm. this was a disaster for mm. Ukraine and the and for NATO mm. and the the big win that they recorded, which is now not even looking like a win, and we'll probably do a separate video for that, mm. was Sweden's entrance into NATO. Mm. But outside of the announcement that Turkey is going to Erdogan said he's going to green light Sweden's entry into NATO, everything else was a complete disaster. Actually Bloomberg had an article where they detailed just how much of a catastrophe and disaster this summit was. Everyone was just arguing with, with everybody. Mm. People are upset with uh, Zelensky. Zelensky's upset with with everybody that, at, uh, at NATO. Erdogan upset with Biden. Um, just a complete mess. A complete mess. So what's your what are your thoughts? No, absolutely. And can I just say a complete mess? Despite the fact that this has been the most heavily trailed and one would have expected carefully prepared NATO summit that I can remember. They've been talking about Vilnius now for months, long since long before this offensive that Ukraine has launched um, in southern, uh, in, you know, on the southern front lines has been underway. So there's no excuse for not getting something like this right. But it's absolutely clear that whatever plans they had, and I am sure that they had very ambitious plans, have been derailed because what they're now facing is not a Ukrainian victory on the battlefronts, but a Ukrainian defeat. And the result is that nothing really worked out as intended. So firstly, let's talk about NATO. I'm going to suggest that in terms of gaining NATO membership, which has been dangled in front of Ukraine for decades. This summit actually goes back on what was um, agreed back in Bucharest, back in 2008. Because in Bucharest, they, uh, Ukraine was invited to apply for NATO membership. It was not given a NATO uh, me um, membership plan, action plan, but the promise was that eventually it would be. That has never happened. Now Stoltenberg, and it's also in the NATO communique, says, well, we're not actually going to give you a membership action plan. Now that is being trailed. It's been presented to the world and to Ukraine itself as some sort of gift to Ukraine. But you could argue, and I think argue more validly, that it is the opposite. Because what it says to Ukraine is, look, you can join one NATO one day. You are absolutely, you know, welcome to join NATO one day. But we decide when that happens and we are going to set the conditions and we can set the conditions and change them whenever we want. And you don't have a membership action plan to enable you to know what those conditions are in advance so that you can work towards meeting them. So it, it, in effect, it pushes Ukraine into a limbo position. And then they said that they were going to provide Ukraine with some kind of security guarantees. And I spent much of yesterday waiting to see what these security guarantees would be. And um, I was told that they would be announced yesterday and then it turned out that they were not going to be given by NATO, but that they were going to be given by countries, individual countries, which are members of the G7, which is, of course, a completely different body. It's an economic and political body. So it's not going to be part of NATO at all. And then, of course, that didn't happen. We didn't get any security guarantees. We got instead a declaration that there would be security guarantees in the future. And it's been widely publicised that there's actually no agreement about what those security guarantees would even amount to. But it's absolutely clear 
that they won't go to war on behalf of Ukraine, even if Ukraine finds itself in future, not now, in future, in a war with Russia. And it's just exactly what you said before, that it's going to be a um, simply a, a deal whereby they supply economic and military support to Ukraine, which is, of course, what they're already doing. So it changes nothing. And then we've had repeated statements by US and NATO and officials, including Biden and Stoltenberg, that Ukraine cannot join NATO until it has won victory on the battlefields and the war itself is over, which means that the Russians are incentivized to continue the war until Ukraine is defeated. Nobody, I think, any longer seriously believes that Ukraine can win the war. So in some total, all that Ukraine has come away with from this meeting is that the, is that the U, U, NATO Ukraine Commission, which already existed, has now been its name has been changed to a NATO Ukraine Council, and that is all. In fact, arguably, its position, Ukraine's position, is worse now than it had been before. And there's two big takes from this. Firstly, NATO is not going to come to Ukraine's rescue over the course of this war. Zelensky has been plugging relentlessly for Ukraine to be fast-tracked into NATO. Let's be absolutely clear. What that's all about is getting NATO involved in the war, because that's the only way Ukraine can win the war or even survive the war. That is not going to happen. No way is that going to happen. And the Americans and the NATO people have, to all intents and purposes, admitted that they're scared of Russia and don't want to go to war with Russia. So all this, you know, year and a half of propaganda about the Russians being incompetent, um, uh, you know, a paper tiger, corrupt, inefficient on the battlefields, that's all been exposed as they don't really think that anymore. And there were some arms packages, but they were pretty low key. The um, Germans are giving uh, 20,000 rounds of ammunition. That's about seven days use by some calculations or four days use. It depends how you calculate figures for Ukraine's ammunition. And that's apparently all Germany has left. And that's it, basically. I mean, nothing else. Lots of rows, lots of anger behind the scenes. Zelensky furious, the entire NATO leadership turning its back on him. You know, the hero of, uh, you know, the last few months is now practically a zero. He's out in the cold. I mean, we've all seen that terrible photograph of him glowering by himself with nobody wanting to speak to him, which is in itself tells the whole story. And of course, we've had even the British coming along and lecturing Zelensky to cool down and to show gratitude and telling him, you know, that they're not Amazon and all of that. So it, it really marks the point, in my opinion, where NATO has had to face the reality and has had to accept that it is losing in Ukraine. And the only thing that they can do now from this moment on is not um, achieve victory, break up Russia, overthrow Putin, do any of those things. What they've got to do now is limit the political damage. Yeah. Uh, here, here are some weapons. Here's some more money. Now go back and keep fighting. Exactly. That's, that was basically the, the, the message they, they gave uh, Zelensky. And, and, and not go fight to win. Just go fight to buy us some more time so we can figure out a way out of this. That's yeah. that's basically the message that yeah. uh, that they gave Zelensky. But you said you said something um, along the lines of um, he's Zelensky's been wanting to his whole motivation to get NATO involved in the war is so that NATO can uh, can fight against his whole motivation to get Ukraine to NATO. Sorry, is so that NATO can fight the conflict. So that Ukraine can uh, can survive against yeah. Russia, so that Ukraine can possibly win or at least uh, survive against Russia in this conflict. 
Um, maybe, maybe we could amend that a little bit and say that uh, Zelensky's motivation in uh, having Ukraine enter NATO is so that NATO can enter the conflict in Ukraine so that he can survive. Well, that's absolutely because correct. Because yeah. I, that photo, you know, everyone says the same. A photo speaks a thousand words. Well, that, that photo, boy, oh boy. And, um, and Biden's comment at the, uh, the press conference, the meeting that they had where Biden told uh, Zelensky so, something along the lines of, you know, you're, I've got bad news for you. We're not going anywhere. You're stuck with us. And then, you know, Zelensky gave a very uneasy laugh. That, that was creepy. That was, that was, that was yeah. not like a good, nah. we're with you forever and we're buddy-buddy and, uh, and mm. all is going to be good. Uh-uh. That was like, you know, we're... Well, it was like a scene we're, we're from gonna the your, We're going to destroy you. We're going to destroy you. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it, it was uh, uh, exactly, yeah. <laughs> it was very... Yeah, your, your thoughts, yeah. No, it was very, very creepy. And I mean, it, it's absolutely clear that, I mean, the, you know, the relationship apparently never easy between Zelensky and Biden but then nobody's relationship with Biden is an easy one as is now universally admitted even Axios is now saying that everybody you know that he bullies everybody and that he's a massive bully within his own team in Washington and of course we've been saying for over a year that nobody likes him internationally well we just see why I mean he's he's insulting he's rude he's aggressive and he didn't like the fact that Zelensky wasn't properly grateful. I mean, you know, and and basically squashed him. I mean, you know, it was it was a very uneasy, unpleasant scene altogether. But there we go. I mean, the one thing I will say about this is that yet again, in a kind of a way, you get the sense that Biden got what he wanted, which is now a, a consistent feature of these summits. He didn't want a commitment to send U.S. troops into Ukraine. He didn't want uh, Ukraine into NATO. He wasn't going to rush to Zelensky's rescue. And without the United States, the Europeans, even the hardline ones, the Baltic states, the Poles, all the rest were forced to fall into line. And the um, statement, the final communique, is entirely in Biden's language, incredibly insulting and rude words about Russia, incredibly insulting and rude words about China, by the way. I mean, the, the, the paragraph on China is horrible, um, very much as a, uh, in Biden's style, but he's clearing the decks. He's focused on the election next year. Ukraine, it didn't work out. He's got his visceral feelings about Putin. But at the end of the day, getting reelected is now his priority, if for no other reason than because one gets the sense that investigations on him are now starting to close in. So he's got to get reelected. It's now his absolute overriding priority. And if Zelensky doesn't like it, well, he can lump it. And uh, Biden told him, look, you can't do anything about it. I'm the boss. You're not. Yeah, we have more emails from, uh, I believe, like 2015, I believe. Yeah. Fox News is reporting on this yeah. emails between uh, Burisma and, and Hunter Biden, Burisma executives and mm. Hunter Biden, which mm. clearly show that there was some uh, exchange of, of, of favors for money, political yeah. favors for money. And anyway, maybe, maybe that's a whole other uh, video he, that we can do there. But yeah, uh, so. obviously, obviously, Biden has had... Uh, interests in Ukraine now for a very long time. Yeah. And, um, and and Zelensky, you know, he, he's trapped. He trapped himself. Yeah. He destroyed his country yeah. so that uh, he could he could get this this EU uh, NATO thing. Um, obviously, he's enriched himself to to incredible uh, levels. Yeah. But um, there's nowhere for him to go now. No, he he is he has to he has to go back and he has to convince the Ukrainian people to keep fighting this war for what, for what, for Europe, the EU, you're not getting in there, for NATO, obviously you're not getting into in, into that alliance. So what 
is the Ukraine military. Why are the Ukrainian people going to continue to fight this conflict? They must realize by now that they are being used. This was never about Ukraine, never about democracy, never about allowing Ukraine into the European Union or allowing Ukraine into uh, NATO. This was always about Russia and Putin and regime change. And, you know, Zelensky, you, you get the sense that he that maybe he finally understands that. Mm. Maybe he's known it all along, but, but finally it, it hit him that he's not going to be part of the clubs. He's not part of the club. He's not going to sit at the at the uh, the adult table. Mm. But, um, you know, what can he do? On the other side of things, you, you know, it, it was Boris Johnson. And it was the UK and it was the US yeah. that did promise Zelensky mm -hmm. all of this fortune and glory if he tore up the agreement they had in March yeah. with Putin and they fought. I mean, they did promise him all these things. That's why That's why the, the statement to, to Ben Wallace, what are we, Amazon? On the one hand, I'm like, yeah, you know, Zelensky's gotten 300 billion and he's still ungrateful. On the flip side, Zelensky can make the argument and say, well... Yeah, you guys promised me all of these things. You just can't leave me, you know, hanging ha hanging out there. So <laughs> well, it's you, such a difficult situation. Well, you are absolutely right. And that is exactly what the row, the, the row is all about. I mean, what, what we've seen are these very angry statements by Zelensky in public, which he was forced to try and moderate on the second day. But, I mean, you can tell what he really feels. So these very angry statements by Zelensky in public, but of course in private, I'm sure that's exactly what he's telling them. And you can understand why the Americans are angry, because he's reminding them of promises of unlimited aid and support until Ukraine won, which is what he perhaps believed in March and April of last year. And of course, the Americans and the British are not able to fulfill those promises. I mean, we now see military packages that are coming out. I mean, for example, the British have provided a military package. And it is nothing. More ammunition for Challenger 2s. The Challenger 2s haven't even fought. <laughs> they haven't even appeared on the battlefronts. And the story is that the British don't want them to go on the battlefronts because they don't want them burning in the same way that the Leopard 2s on the battlefronts are burning. Remember, apparently the British army itself only has 50 working examples of these tanks. So they don't want to see a, you know, a fifth of the global operating tank fleet, Challenger 2 flank tank fleet, burning on the Ukrainian steppes. And just a few more armored vehicles. And that's it. That's all that Britain has left that it can supply to Ukraine. And yeah, you're absolutely right. You see, they didn't expect to be in this position. They didn't think in that in August 2023, they would be in a position where they had to tell Zelensky, you know, that blank check we gave you in April last year, we can't, th there's no more money in the bank for us, for, for you to cash. They, they didn't expect that. They thought that the sanctions would caused the Russian economy to implode. They persuaded themselves that the Russian military was inefficient and incompetent. They didn't expect, they didn't think that within a year of the US elections, they would find themselves in a no-win situation. So they gave Zelensky all of those promises and now they have to tell him straightforwardly that they can't fulfill them. And um, that's basically what the whole Amazon thing is all about. It was um, Ben Wallace telling Zelensky, look, I can't give you any more what you're asking for. And you ought to be grateful for what we've given. Which, as I said, it, it's godfatherish when you sort of think through its implications. But, I mean, it's, what, it's all they have. And um, they go away angry with Zelensky. But ultimately, I suspect at some level, they're also angry with themselves.
Yeah, but you know they still go to Vilnius and they oh, have a good time and they oh, joke yeah. around and they're all smiles and they get all dressed up and they have these lavish mm. dinners and uh, mm. you know they're sending uh, Zelensky back to to Ukraine and yeah. you know my, my question to you is what does he do now? What does he do? How does he? How does he and his team get out of this? How do they survive this? Yeah, well, I, I'm going to make my it. my opinion very quickly is. If he can, and I don't even know if this is possible, I think the only way out for him is via Russia. Yeah. That's yeah. if Putin would entertain uh, providing him an off ramp, if Putin w would actually do such a thing. I, I don't know. I'm just floating stuff out there. But I mean, given all the horrible things that, that, that Zelensky has, has, has done, but um, I, I can't see of any other way out for him. Well, that is the rational thing to do. Uh, he ought to, I mean, he, he's got no direct communication line to Moscow, apparently, but the Chinese are there. Li Hui visited Kiev and Moscow, said that he's prepared to act as mediator. And what perhaps Zelensky could do is contact the Chinese, pass on a message to Moscow, say, let's sit down and talk and see what we can agree. Um, that's what he rationally should do the, the problem he faces if he does that is that the russians see him as ir ir irreparably spoiled goods i mean they were prepared to negotiate with him last year but he went back on what he said uh, what he agreed to um he's been a very difficult and ugly opponent i mean he's from a russian point of view he's carried out um his intelligence agencies has, have carried out murders on Russian territory, planted bombs, done all kinds of things of that kind. Um, he's engaged in some appalling rhetoric against the Russians. Um, there are Russian officials, Medvedev, for example, who are saying straightforwardly that he's not somebody they're prepared to deal with. What he ought to rationally do, and this is my own personal view, is he ought to contact the Chinese, tell them Ukraine needs to find peace, tell Putin that we're prepared to do that, and I'm prepared to step down and go to my villas in Italy or Florida, where, whatever. That's probably his best, his best policy. Of course, he has problems. He won't with survive in, in the villas in, in Florida. That, and, that, you know, that, that is his other problem. That is his other problem. But, I mean, he's, he is in a very, very difficult position. And you're absolutely right. And, I mean, you know, it won't be the Russians, I suspect, who will come after him. You talked about betrayal. I mean, it'll be lots of people in Ukraine will be very, very angry with him at the end of this as well. Now, what he's actually going to do is he's going to continue the war because he's now in that situation where probably he has his back to the wall and he has no choice. He has a very, very well organized media operation in Kiev. That's about the one thing he has working for him. So I, I think that you're going to see a concerted and major attempt in Ukraine to spin this that, um, you know, we got more from Vilnius than appears. We gained all kinds of assurances and we've got to keep fighting and we're going to break through. And the Russians will run out of ammunition and they'll run out of men and they're drunk and incompetent and inferior to us in every respect. And in a few weeks, in a few months, if we keep hammering, we'll be on our way to Crimea. All of the evidence suggests that the soldiers on the front lines in the Ukrainian army are now increasingly doubting that narrative. But that's what he's got. Yeah, that'll only carry him for a few more months. Yeah. Well, increasingly, the word is that he's got until the end of the year. Now, there's even a report today that he's been told by the US that uh, he's got to break through to Crimea by November. And if he doesn't, then he's got to accept the fact that support next year is going to dwindle. He's not going to break through to Crimea in November, uh, by November. I mean, that's um, uh, fantasy stuff. If that's what Biden really told him, then he really is cutting Zelensky off. 
So he's probably got until the end of the year. He's a resourceful man. He'll try to come up with some escape plan. We'll see what he does. Yeah. Escape plan. That's mm -hmm. what he's going to try to come up with. I agree. Mm -hmm. So he's going to try to buy enough time mm -hmm. so that he can come up with this, uh, this escape plan. Yeah. Sometime in the winter. Yeah. Because that's when everything ends. Yes. Well, ammo, money, money, all of it. Yes. Shoigu gave a number of 26,000 since June 4th. Yeah. Ukrainian soldiers lost. Yeah, no, yeah. 26,000. Um, well, no, and I think this is probably correct. If you believe it. Well, if you believe it, but, you know, sure, you also said uh, a few weeks ago that the Russians are getting all these casualty numbers from intercepts of U internal Ukrainian communications. And I think this is plausible. And that makes one think that these numbers may be, may be correct. And somebody did a, 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 a person, a, statist a statistician did a, a, um, an extrapolation of possible Ukrainian casualties based upon that opinion, that survey that was done a few weeks ago in Ukraine, which showed that 63% of Ukrainians know somebody who was killed or wounded in the fighting. And in fact, most of them, though many more than just one person. And on that, on the strength of that, that person was able to calculate or came up with calculations that put Ukrainian losses, and here I mean dead Ukrainians, into the, well, closer, close towards 200,000. Okay, let's wrap this video up with uh, just one statement from... Uh... Jake Sullivan about the F-16s, where he mm. said that uh, Ukraine is going to get F-16s and they're likely going to come from European countries that have excess F-16 supplies. Yeah. So, so in Captain, other words, European countries going to give their 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 you know their F-16s that are mothballed or just you know. sitting in the garage somewhere that that are just in excess. You know those F those excess F-16s. Yeah. That's what they're going to hand over to Ukraine to fight the Russian. Uh, Air Force. Clapped Fifth out, generation. Clapped Air out Force. old F-16s, some of them apparently from the 1980s. Um, and, and they're going to be sent to take on the Russian Air Force and the most advanced air defense system in the world. And probably there'll be just a few dribbles of them. And it's not going to happen before next year, it seems. I mean, it's just... I mean, in, in a way... training program. I know. <laughs> I mean, the cruelty of this is, is terrible. Um, there, was, there was an article, there was a piece by Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis that I saw, which said that the 47th Mechanized Brigade of the Ukrainian Army, which is its most elite brigade in some respects, it's the one that was equipped with all the Bradleys, which more and more are being lost every day, and one has now been captured. Anyway, the commander of that Bradley, of that, sorry, of that, of that brigade, is 28 years old. And Daniel Davis pointed out that he has the same level of training and experience as a second lieutenant would do in the US military. And these people are being sent to yeah. fight. I mean, it's, as I said, the cruelty of this is something we should never lose sight of. I almost have a, a feel. I have like this feeling, this suspicion that mm. uh, given all of the, the investigations towards Biden, mm. which are focused primarily on Burisma and Ukraine, mm. that uh, what's taking place right now, this cruelty that is taking place right now, um, this, this obvious uh, decision to just uh, allow Ukraine to just, you know, destruct, to just, yeah. to just destroy itself. Yeah. Um, it, it's, is Biden's way of taking out his, for some, uh, his anger maybe? Maybe he yeah. feels like an anger and a resentment yeah. against Ukraine because these investigations are now seeing some daylight and in yeah. Biden's weird, twisted yeah. uh, mind, he's, he's kind of like, you know, uh, yeah. I, will, uh, I wish I never um, got involved in Ukraine and Burisma. And now I've got these investigations hanging over my head and I've got Hunter and, and all yeah. of these things. So, you know, I'm just, just, let's just keep them fighting until Ukraine is no more. I, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's I wouldn't that, be surprised. It, it I plays would, it to I, Biden's character, you know, it's like yeah. that Biden, Biden's character 
I, I wouldn't I wouldn't yeah. be surprised at all. I mean, Christopher Ray, who's the FBI director, has blurted out that the U.S. attorney in Delaware has now opened an investigation into these bribery allegations. Now, that's only an investigation. And, you know, we've seen investigations of Biden and of Hunter, and they go into all kinds of strange places. I'm not going to pre- anticipate that. As you said correctly, it requires a separate programme. But for the moment, at least, I, 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 you know, it, it's entirely plausible that Biden is now becoming angry and frustrated with Ukraine. He's, this project that he launched there has failed, and Ukraine is only giving him problems. A project he launched in 2014. Absolutely. Well, what okay. was it? Obama, what well, was it? Obama well, said about him. The thing about the thing about Joe is he always f's up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He always finds a way to uh, to f up. But Biden appointed him as the uh, as the ruler of uh, of Ukraine. Absolutely, Biden did, did, did uh, give him uh, Obama, that Obama. Obama. Obama gave him that position exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. there we go. Obama also said, "Let's not let's not uh, get involved in Ukraine because Russia has escalatory dominance." We've been saying that for a while now. That that yeah. Obama statement, but no one, no one paid no any one, attention. No I mean, it, 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 it's quite remarkable that a statement of the obvious like that um, <laughs> needed to be said by one person, which is Obama, uh, who everybody pretends has the a brain the size of a planet. He doesn't, by the way. <laughs> he thinks he does, but he doesn't. But he makes a statement like that, which is the statement of the obvious, and nobody pays any attention. Well, there we go. Yeah. All right, That's we'll what we end said. it. There we go. All right, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, Bitch, Shoot, Telegram, and Rockfin, and go to the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care. <laughs>